questions? Oh, we'd love to. Would you love to do that? I would love to. And I'll hand one over to this other side Excellent. of the room. Excellent. I didn't know there was audience participation. There is audience participation. I know. I know. Now it's supposed to be right. You sit in the front. You don't have to sit by me if you don't want to. I will. It's okay. I'm not embarrassed. <laughs> he, got over, he got over that years ago. Yeah. 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 About, about 23 years. He's kind of been caught. It's been a good bit that long. Oh, Mike, he's been in big trouble for 23 years. I'm used to it. You're used to it. You want to come up and confess anything before we share? I don't think so. You're good, I'm good. I'm good. So I think we're going to get started here. There may be some more people who come uh, in as we uh, uh, go through the presentation today, but thank you for coming to learn more about um, the AIDS Resource Center of Wisconsin. I've had the pleasure of working at ARCW for the last 21 years, um, which find, I find amazing these days, but um, I always appreciate an opportunity to talk about the work that we do and the challenges that uh, we continue to face as an organization. And we're going to start with a little audience participation today. And Amy was so kind to volunteer. <laughs> so just open up the envelope and tell yes. us what the winner read what's on the card. HIV is a serious health problem in Africa, not in Wisconsin. Thoughts on that from anybody? It's serious in Africa, it's probably serious. A lot of attention is paid to an international fight against HIV these days. Uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, some of these maroon-colored countries, 15% uh, of the general population is living with HIV and AIDS. And uh, what you see is a lot of national, international attention. Bono, you see Elton John and Sharon Stone, Bill Gates, who all are really directing their attention and their resources to the fight against AIDS in Africa, which is wonderful. Um, but we still have our challenges here in Wisconsin. I should point out that Bill didn't uh, sneeze at an inopportune time here <laughs> in the country of Madagascar. But if you go just a few blocks east of St. Matthews, what you'll see is one in three young gay black men in this community living with HIV and AIDS. So Sub-Saharan Africa, 15% of the population, some neighborhoods in uh, the west side of Milwaukee, one in three young gay black men. And that's actually on, a, on an increase. Um, a couple years ago, we saw an 8% increase in new HIV infections, followed up by a 19% increase in new HIV infections, largely among young people who were born after the... Didn't you get the memo about what time <laughs> we were starting? <laughs> uh, young people who were born after Magic Johnson announced <laughs> that uh, he was HIV positive. So HIV is actually on the rebound. We've reported more than 8,000, or there's more than 8,000 people living with HIV in the state of Wisconsin right now, which is an all-time record. Kristen, what about the second card? It's easy to live with HIV. All you have to do is take one pill a day. I didn't think I was giving that to a pharmacist. <laughs> <laughs> Any thoughts about that? This is a, a triple, it actually is a one pill a day regimen. Um, that if taken correctly at the right time, every day for the rest of your life, you have a pretty good chance of living a long and healthy life with HIV. That doesn't mean it's easy to live with HIV. In fact, for about 60% of our patients, this is what their breakfast looks like. And they'll take another, uh, uh, another set of pills at lunch and at dinner time. And for our patients, about 94% of them live in poverty. And even after the advent of the Affordable Care Act, we're still seeing about 20% of them who still do not have health care coverage. So living with HIV while it's getting easier still is a very significant challenge for most people. Why, why will that 20% um, be so high, Mike? The 20% who are uh, not going to be insured, one, um, will be folks who aren't eligible for the ACA because of uh, citizenship status. Uh, and then secondly, um, I, I think um, we as a country have done a very bad job of educating people about what the Affordable Care Act is and some of the scare tactics that some have been talking about how the Affordable Care Act is bad and don't sign up for it. It's been a very significant barrier for us. And then third, it remains a financial situation. $95 is the, is the penalty if you don't sign up for the Affordable Care Act. And we have plenty of people who are saying, 
okay, government, come find me, and when you find me, find the $95 um, to uh, find me. So we're certainly hopeful. And, and then Wisconsin being a non-Medicaid expansion state, that would really be important. Feel free to jump in with questions at any time. There are two videos. If you ask a question in the middle of a video, you'll see exactly how inept I am with technology. Um, <laughs> ARCW envisions a world without AIDS and that everybody with HIV live a long and healthy life. This is what really draws me to our vision statement and whenever I see it is the word strives and I want to help educate and share with you the story of ARCW about how we've constantly evolved to meet the new needs of people living with HIV and AIDS and I'll do that in a slide or two. Our mission statement is to be at the forefront of HIV prevention, care and treatment and when I look at our mission statement the word forefront is the one that I always uh, my and my staff really focus on and um, we measure that. Um, so I'm really happy to say that just this week the federal government sent out its health report card on all the states and for the fourth consecutive year it found that Wisconsin has the lowest HIV mortality rate in the country. Um, so it's actually about 20% lower than the state of Minnesota and there's a lot of attention being paid to health outcomes in the state of Massachusetts right now because they had health care reform many years before we did and I'm happy to say that they're I'm happy to say that we're, our mortality rate is half of theirs. So um, we've been able to, that, that's how we define forefront and we want to always focus on how we can stay there and continue to improve our response. Mike, is there a... Uh, and just as the video comes up. <laughs> <laughs> is there a reason why Wisconsin has that result? Do we have better education? Do we have better education? Medication or statistically, why should we be that much better than us? So states? modestly, why why are we doing better? <laughs> modestly, and, yes. and I want to be modest about this. We have an integrated care delivery system in Wisconsin that is really the envy of the country, um, and we now have organizations in 20 different states who have reached out to ARCW to help learn about how we're integrating our model of care and, and helping achieve those better outcomes. Um, Wisconsin historically has had a pretty progressive health care system. Our Medicaid program, while it's not being expanded under the Affordable Care Act, is uh, certainly much more comprehensive than other states. As an example, in the state of Texas, if you're on Medicaid, Medicaid will pay for three prescriptions. And if you think about that picture, that slide with all those different pills, in Wisconsin they've always had access to all of those medications. So those are some of the reasons. Um, I think aggressive prevention early on in the epidemic uh, helped stave off new infections that help keep the overall HIV infection rate lower in our state. Okay. Yes, sir? Why is it that some of the folks just need the one pill and other people need like the, the 10 pill? Um, HIV um, mutates, um, so we're not actually fighting one virus. The virus mutates in a lot of different ways. Um, so uh, there's probably about 40 or 45 different regimens that people with HIV may be on. Um, <coughs> And then for many people with HIV, they have other health conditions, um, neurocognitive impairment, liver, can uh, liver cancer, hepatitis C, hypertension, all those sorts of diseases are uh, much more likely to be occurring among the HIV population than the general population. And they tend to occur earlier. Um, so what we're seeing is neurocognitive impairments, pre-Alzheimer's, and HIV patients in their late 40s and early 50s or society, we may view that as something that would happen maybe a generation later. Uh, in, in like the percentage, when you talk about the percentage of has been rising, mm -hmm. is that because of more affliction or is it because of more freedoms amongst the people to come out and uh, ask for help? Yeah. I think, um, it, I think it, it's very much focused among young people, young people under 21 years old. And I think what we're doing really poorly as a country right now, or as a society right now, is educating people about HIV. So my daughter's here, she came to, uh, to hear Dad speak, and a couple years ago I stole her health book. You know, the NSA has nothing on the surveillance that Donna and I have. <laughs> Let's just be clear, so text messages, whatever it is, Twitter, Facebook, the whole nine yards, poor kid. Um, so, um, like a good dad, I wanted to see what she was learning about um, HIV in her health class, or her, her health uh, textbook. And I looked through it, and there was half a page of information about HIV. It said HIV equals death. Now, as a dad, that may be okay, you know, a scare tactic. 
but we know that that's not the reality. It was a textbook that was written in 1984. Um, and you would have hoped that the teacher, I'm not gonna beat up on schools, they can't buy new textbooks every year, but you would have hoped the teacher maybe would have augmented something you know, off the internet. There's really nothing. So I think we're educating a generation of young people who are ignorant to the threat of HIV. And if that's the case, we shouldn't be particularly surprised if we're seeing an uptick in new HIV infections. See if we can restart this video. So meeting all the challenges of AIDS, many of us remember the early days of HIV and AIDS. This was a time of disease diagnosis, uh, disease progression and death, the Carposi sarcoma lesions, which were sort of the telltale signs of HIV. ARCW responded with aggressive HIV prevention, particularly among the LGBT community and the bars, a lot of testing so that people could protect themselves from HIV and AIDS, and then a community-wide prevention education system. As HIV became part of the injection drug use community, uh, we started our LifePoint Clean Needle Exchange Program. Uh, it's legal in the state of Wisconsin and it's reduced new HIV infections among that population by 76%. Um, HIV quickly became a disease of poverty and we responded by um, opening up a food pantry. Single men were uh, not denied access to local food pantries for food in the late 80s and early 90s, so we responded with a food pantry. Many people with HIV were kicked out of their homes and communities, uh, so we uh, built a housing program that now assures nobody with HIV need be homeless in Wisconsin. We've got two attorneys on staff. Unfortunately, discrimination is a significant issue that people with HIV and AIDS face, and they handle about 900 cases on an annual basis. This is my next, this is my favorite slide. In 1995, uh, this medication came out. It was the first antiretroviral that allowed people to be treated effectively with HIV. And we quickly responded by opening up the ARCW Medical Center, which is now the largest medical clinic serving HIV patients in the state of Wisconsin. We serve about 1,400 people living with HIV and AIDS, comprehensive primary care, all of their HIV care and treatment, and then some of our specialty care is also on site. It includes uh, our recognition by the National Committee on Quality Assurance as a patient-centered medical home, one of only two HIV clinics in the country. We have a dental clinic, any of the dental care that we would get in any of uh, our private dentist settings, so it's a lot nicer than where I go get my teeth cleaned. <laughs> um, and then we open up the ARCW Pharmacy, which assures, assures that everybody with HIV gets all the medications that they need regardless of their ability to pay. And that means we have to uh, raise about $500,000 a year to pay for our uninsured patients. Wisconsin is in our name. When I came to ARCW back in 1993, we were just in Milwaukee, Nosha, and working with people living with HIV and AIDS up in Eau Claire. We were able to start our services there in 1993, assuring that all the same access to care is available in western Wisconsin. We went through a corporate merger with an organization in Green Bay and Appleton to expand our services there, and then we worked with public health leaders in Madison and La Crosse, Wausau and Superior, assuring regardless of where you live in the state of Wisconsin, you have access to care and treatment. Donors, volunteers, advocates have been wonderful response. This is another reason why Wisconsin's doing better. The community response to fight against AIDS has been very good. Assuring that we have medications for everybody. Uh, we've had over 90,000 donors that have supported the fight against AIDS. Uh, making sure that all the care uh, can be provided that's necessary. Making sure that the food pantry shelves are stocked making sure there's housing for everybody, and ultimately improving the quality of lives for the patients that we serve. So that, I think, is intended just to share with you that ARCW is constantly striving to evolve to meet the new challenges of HIV and AIDS. Um, when we think about ARCW, we think about it in terms of what we do to prevent the spread of HIV and then care and treatment services. So let's talk about prevention a little bit. Um, this is the continuum of services that we offer. HIV education, we can all think back to high school and everybody going down to the gymnasium for a symposium on something. Uh, so we're, we're uh, talking to that sort of group of folks and we may do that in alternative uh, high schools, um, in domestic violence shelters, um, in boys and girls clubs, those sorts of locations. Risk reduction is more of a one-on-one, -on -one, more intimate conversation about how individuals can reduce and ultimately eliminate their uh, HIV behavior. Materials distribution, we did uh, we, we distribute pamphlets and brochures, uh, about 500,000 condoms on an annual basis. 
And then last year we exchanged 2.5 million needles um, to help reduce the spread of HIV among injection drug users. Some of you may have uh, heard about the heroin, uh, and the increase in the heroin uh, epidemic in the state of Wisconsin. I'm really excited to tell you last week that the state legislature passed a law that um, makes ARCW's Narcan distribution program legal um, and assures access to Narcan uh, much more widely. Narcan is a medication that if you inject into somebody who's in a drug overdose, it stops the effect of the drug overdose, literally drawing them back from, the, from death. And I'm happy to say over the last couple of years that we have successfully administered Narcan in 2,136 instances, um, saving those people's lives from uh, a drug opiate overdose. And what's really great about that is that when somebody's gone through that, they're really interested in getting into drug treatment and offer drugs. <laughs> <laughs> HIV testing, very important. We do about 2,500 HIV tests each year. And it's uh, particularly important because uh, knowing your HIV status is the entryway to getting into care and accessing those medications that allow you to live a long and healthy life. And that's where linkage to care um, is so important. Nationally, 20% of people living with HIV don't know that they're HIV positive yet because they haven't been tested. And then once they're tested, 20% of people with HIV don't get into care. So these are people who we know are HIV positive, we know that when you're HIV positive, you have to have access to health care if you're going to live a long and healthy life. And somehow they're falling out of uh, the care continuum from here over here. I'm really happy to say in the last three years that 100% of the people at ARCW's tested positive for HIV are still in care today. So I think that's the beginning of that integrated model that creates better outcomes because we're not losing people. Before you move on to the slide. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit more about education. Where, where are you focusing your education efforts? ARCW is, uh, on the care and treatment side, ARCW is the largest provider of care and treatment. On prevention, there's lots of different places and lots of different organizations that do prevention work. So we tend to focus our prevention on uh, populations at higher risk for HIV and then work with and provide resources to other organizations uh, that would be in the schools or in um, boys and girls clubs, although we do some work at, uh, with boys and girls clubs. So a lot of times what we're doing is street-based outreach in neighborhoods that have high concentrations of HIV, um, which are on the north and south side of Milwaukee. Um, we do um, a lot of internet-based outreach um, in this day and age as the internet becomes a vehicle where people meet up uh, sex partners. Um, and then um, we do uh, general uh, public uh, education we have a website that's devoted to HIV prevention education, so parents or teachers can go there to talk to, to learn to talk about HIV with young folks. Um, we um, have a, a walk-in location where people can come and get those sorts of information. And we work with Planned Parenthood and uh, other community groups to do additional work. And then the other question I have is, <coughs> what is your background? How did you end up? <laughs> Desperation is the real answer. <laughs> I graduated uh, from college in 1992, and uh, that was when Bill Clinton was running around the country saying, it's the economy, stupid. Right? We, that was bad economic times, recessionary times, and um, I would, uh, honestly couldn't find a job. Um, and it took me about six months, and ARCW hired me to start our government relations program. I had a political science degree from my undergraduate, which is entirely not marketable unless you do one thing, go to law school. <laughs> I wasn't going to do that. Uh, I had a chance to grow our government relations program for about five or six years, and then um, our previous CEO uh, named me the chief operating officer um, and gave me a chance to uh, really build this model of care that we're going to talk about this morning. So um, I, I came to ARCW out of a need for a job, and it's become a passion for my life. Yes? Do you have any program uh, for education in MPS? Yes, I want to sit in their buildings. There's 438 school districts in the state of Wisconsin, and uh, what happens in those buildings are decided by those school boards. And um, some are very good. And it, the, the ones that are really good are in the more politically conservative parts of the state of Wisconsin. The Fox River Valley have very good relationships with um, the school districts there, but there are other school districts that just simply have no interest in us working with them, unfortunately. 
this is the HIV medical home, and this is what's getting a lot of national attention at ARCW. So if you go to 820 North Plankington, um, you'll see all these services um, alive and uh, serving our patients and clients. We serve about 3,000 people across the state on an annual basis. And if we start, just because my graphic designer wanted to make it difficult on me, we're going to start at 12 o'clock and we're going to go counterclockwise. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody else would have designed it clockwise. Medical care, uh, John Fangman is pictured there with one of our patients. Our physicians are jointly appointed to the faculty of the Medical College of Wisconsin and to a position at ARCW to provide primary care, all their HIV care, on-site hepatology, which is important for our patients, and I'm happy to say on-site psychiatry services. Um, we do use the Epic Electronic Health Record, so all of our information can be uh, shared with the other health systems in town as our patients end up in inpatient or in emergency room settings. As we are moving counterclockwise, the dental clinic, which you saw in the video earlier, um, about 1,400 uh, dental patients, a few more dental patients than medical patients, because dental care is so difficult to access when you're low income. Uh, all of the dental care um, that you may need, um, we provide. At 9 o'clock, you see two of our mental health therapists. National research would show that half of people with HIV and AIDS have a need to access mental health care at some time during the course of their disease. And uh, we provide individual and group counseling, uh, neurocognitive testing, psychiatry, as I talked about. And then my staff's talked us into some wellness programming. So um, we do mindful yoga and uh, EMDR, which is a visualization exercise. And we've even gotten to the point of artistic expression. And um, what we have found in all of those is not only are they wildly popular among our patients and clients, but folks that are enrolled in those programs also tend to be more uh, likely to make their medical appointments and stick on their medication regimens. Our drug treatment. said, fine, fine, we'll do it, it's working. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> our drug treatment program, uh, we take a little bit different tact at drug treatment than most, and it's called a harm reduction based. Uh, program so you don't have to stop using drugs and then get into treatment to figure out how to live a life of sobriety. Uh, we enroll people uh, who are active uh, <coughs> are drug users, work with them to set goals to reduce and ultimately eliminate their drug use. We're the only state licensed program in Wisconsin that offers drug treatment in that manner. Um, here's Rebecca Kopak Farrell, who's our Director of Legal Services. Um, she heads up the uh, clinic, the legal clinic that serves about 900 people with HIV. A lot of uh, healthcare powers of attorney, permanency planning, uh, given the population that we serve. Uh, certainly a lot of landlord tenant disputes, social security disability appeals, and then some of those discrimination cases um, that we've talked about. There's been uh, instances in the last couple of years of people living with HIV fired uh, from their jobs because of their HIV status. In Eau Claire, we had a homeless shelter. We wouldn't allow one of our patients in to the shelter uh, last November on a cold night because he was HIV positive. Um, to a 16-year-old girl up in Wausau who got her first job bagging groceries, and when they found out she was HIV positive, they said, well, you can work for us, but you have to stay in the back room and you can't touch uh, anything that may cut you. Um, pretty traumatic for a 16-year-old kid to go through that sort of situation. Uh, here is our pharmacy, uh, we, that's a statewide operation, uh, locally people can come in and get their medications or we uh, courier medications to people's homes or UPS delivers next day around the state. Any medication that people would need, um, not just for their HIV but for their hypertension or diabetes or anything else. Social work case management, this is a group of about 25 people who work one on one with our patients and clients to overcome whatever their challenges are. Um, whether it's homelessness or domestic violence, uh, drug addiction, um, so that they can focus on care and treatment. The ARCW Food Pantry, we provide about 525,000 pounds of food to our patients on an annual basis. And then housing, we provided about 70,000 overnights to our patients, either through our two housing facilities or through paying uh, for rent. And these two are particularly important because we know that somebody who is hungry is going to be more focused on putting food in their stomach than medications that will keep them alive. And we know somebody who is homeless is going to be more focused on seeking out shelter and seeking out a doctor's appointment. So if we're not able to address those lower levels of, I want to say Pavlov's triangle, Maslow's triangle of need, um, if we're not able to address those lower levels of need, um, then we're not going to be able to successfully get people into care and treatment. I think that's another reason why we do better in terms of
Um, I can talk forever about this circle, and I can throw lots of numbers out at it, but when I look at this circle, um, Kathy comes to mind. Um, being at ARCW for 21 years, I've had the distinct pleasure of getting to know a fair number of our patients and clients. And Kathy came to ARCW about 10 years ago, newly diagnosed with HIV, and she couldn't even handle the concept that she was HIV positive, but she was ready to tackle the idea that uh, she needed to uh, move towards a drug-free life. Uh, she entered our drug treatment program. I'm really pleased to say that after a while, she actually entered an era of sobriety, and then she started moving around this circle to almost every one of those spots um, and getting into care and treatment and taking the medications. And she finally got to something called an undetectable viral load. And that means that your HIV is treated as best as possible. It's as healthy as you can be living with HIV. Mm -hmm. Kathy started volunteering at ARCW. She would work down in our food pantry. She would work at the reception desk. She would stuff envelopes, all those sorts of things. We have a client advisory board. She chaired that for a while. And we were all really excited because she was a great success story. Um, Kathy then did what so many of us in life do. She found her soulmate. It was a guy here in Milwaukee who'd also had sort of a troubled past, and together they decided that they were going to start anew. And they were going to leave Milwaukee in the rearview mirror because that was a, a place of challenge in their lives, and they moved to a community about uh, 90 minutes away from here. We were all very excited about it. It was, a, it was really uplifting to see her move on with her life. And about six weeks later, I got a phone call from Kathy. And she was just in tears. And it turned out that her soulmate was really a creep. She'd been beaten every day since she left home parking. Um, this woman got in her car and she drove 90 miles, picked up Kathy and a few of her belongings before her soulmate got home from work that day, brought her back, and Kathy stayed in that building. That night she wasn't beaten and she wasn't homeless for the first time in six weeks. Unfortunately, she also quit taking her medications during that six-week time period and no longer had an undetectable life without it. That circle, I'm convinced, will allow me someday to tell this story and assure people that she's back at that undetectable viral load. But that's what I think is what's so special about ARCW and, in general, the medical home model of care that we as a society need to strive for. Aurora, we love Aurora at ARCW, we love Wheaton, we love all these health systems. There's not many clinics or health systems that would go to that extent to help their patients uh, live a long and healthy life. Any questions about the medical home? What, how old was Kathy when she started? Kathy was 42 years old and she was diagnosed with, ARC, uh, with HIV, and that was probably nine years ago. Can you say something about uh, a young homeless, young, Homeless. Young homeless kids um, are at um, extraordinary risk for HIV. Um, Walker's Point is a great organization here in town who is uh, doing a lot of work with that population. We're able to integrate um, a lot of our services uh, with them. But uh, when you're homeless and you're young, you're likely to engage in behaviors to secure housing. And oftentimes those behaviors can also lead to uh, putting yourself at risk for HIV. So. Young people represent more than half of new HIV infections in the state of Wisconsin and around the country right now. And that's really a population that we need to hone in on. Milwaukee County, the last time I heard, I don't know if this is still the current data, Milwaukee County had six, Milwaukee County has 16 beds for young homeless people. Um, and you know, if you think about a county of over a million people, um, we have more than 16 homeless teenagers in this county. So I think that in general that's an issue that is very poorly addressed locally. Um, not you know, Walker's Point and others are doing great work, but um, we need to put more resources. And how many of those, do you have any figure on uh, young people who are uh, kicked out of home because they are HIV? Um, yeah, and just anecdotally, um, that a lot of people come our way with that story. Yes? So like how, uh, um, I mean, this model of holistic care is, of course, being talked a lot these days, not only for you, but as a more productive way of providing health care in general. How um, are changes in health care system and people's access to that affecting your set of patients? Are they, they have access to different resources that you can help them with? Um, how do those changes 
happening all around healthcare these days affect your agency? I think it's a great question, Dave. There is a lot of challenges in terms, or changes in terms of uh, how healthcare is being provided, but right now it's really talk in this community, to be, to be really honest, and not just this community, around the country. Uh, the development of medical homes is called for under the Affordable Care Act, and there's actually a lot of financial incentives for it. Certainly there's uh, financial incentives for affordable care organizations, ACOs, but I, I have not seen that start to affect in any positive way access uh, to care for our patients and clients. And in fact, what uh, local studies show is 90,000 and 200,000 residents in Milwaukee County have tenuous access to health care at best, and that number hasn't budged. Uh, and maybe it's a little bit too early in the onset of the Affordable Care Act for it to move, but we certainly hope that this is an example that others can uh, benefit from. Um, this is a really life-giving model. Uh, maybe you talked about this already, but how, how do you fund all that? <laughs> um, no, I haven't talked about that, so it's a great oh. question. <laughs> we're gonna, there, there's a slide coming up that we're going to talk okay. about that a little bit, but ARCW has emerged um, as the largest AIDS service organization in America. Uh, we have a $45 million budget, which is a lot of money when you think about community-based organization, um, but when medications cost $2,000 a month, and that's part of your budget, it doesn't take long for it to add up. Um, we generate um, about two-thirds of our funding we generate off of the services we provide. So if patients come to us with Medicaid or Medicare or private insurance, we'll bill. Um, about 10 million of it um, we get through different government grants and then we need to raise between four and five million dollars in private resources on an annual basis. Um, and there's a great opportunity on April 26th for people to join us. <laughs> that, that, that's the teaser for what's coming up. <laughs> Any other questions? How does, I've got a question. Yeah. How does this, it's a fantastic model. What are other states doing or not doing? Why don't you hold on to that for a couple okay. slides? Okay. okay. Um, so, um, in addition to uh, my political science background, I did pick up an MBA along the way. So, I tend to run the organization more from a spreadsheet perspective than a social work perspective. Uh, we measure our results substantially. Uh, I probably give a stack of papers on a quarter about that quarterly about that thick that uh, talks about our results. This issue of patients with an undetectable viral load, as healthy as you can be, nationally 28% of people with HIV have an undetectable viral load. At ARCW, 82% of our patients have this undetectable viral load. Um, HIV tests identifying a new HIV infection, nationally less than 1%, actually 0.8% of HIV tests identify somebody who's HIV positive. At ARCW, this uh, fluctuates from year to year. I think we're at 4.7% of our tests identified somebody who's HIV positive. That's really important because it allows that person to get into care and hopefully get to that undetectable viral load level. And the latest research shows that somebody with HIV who has an undetectable viral load is 96% less likely to transmit HIV. Um, that's that scientific biolog biology stuff that I don't understand, um, but um, it somebody with an undetectable viral load is much less infectious. So not only is it good for the patient, but it's good for the community to strive for this issue of undetectable viral Does load. Does that 5% mean that your tests are better? Does that mean more people are coming to you and then getting tested? Does it, mean it means we're targeting people who are more likely to be positive for HIV and just widely testing uh, the general population. Okay, and, what's, and, uh, and who's in the standard model? Is that other, that other is, groups that is like 290 yours? organizations like us around the country that's funded by the federal government. The benchmark. Patients with HIV also have um, many other health care needs. Here, patients with diabetes and HIV who have their diabetes well managed, nationally 29% at ARCW, 84% of our patients have their diabetes well managed. Again, that's that integrated model of care, primary care and HIV care together. If you're a person living with HIV in Madison, where we don't have our clinical operations, and you go to the University of Wisconsin uh, hospital and clinics, you have to go one place to get your HIV care, and you have to go someplace else to get your primary care. And that is a, a really an outdated model that we need to um, improve upon. If you line up all of the clinical outcomes for people living with HIV and AIDS, ARCW beats the national standard on 94% of the measures. Um, so we've got room to improve, um, but we do a lot of focus on that. Um, that doesn't mean we don't look at uh, the outcomes of our administrative operations. Um, here, the United Way would say that a nonprofit organization 
that spends 80 cents on the dollar in services is doing a good job. For every dollar ARCW receives, 95% of it goes directly to care and treatment or prevention services. So we feel we're doing very well there. Um, somebody, oh, here we go. So we measure our clinical outcomes in that manner, but we also measure our clinical outcomes this way. My name is uh, James Kelly. I've been diagnosed with uh, HIV uh, since 1989. My name is Wanda I. Santiago, and um, I've been HIV since 1990. Well, that's when I was diagnosed. I asked them questions. How do they feel about working around people with this virus and AIDS? You know, and it's not a problem. They say they love it, and I could see the sincerity in them. When you don't have everything together, like here, um, it could be very confusing because I was out there. Well, all of the uh, nursing staff, the uh, lab technicians, when I go to get my lab work did, you know, that draws my blood and stuff, they all are concerned, you know, uh, I get the best and I don't have a dime. I feel at home here. This is my second home uh, because I have everything here. Just stories from two of our patients. Um, Wanda, uh, she talks about Air Stubby feeling like her home. Um, she brought her 17th grandchild in right after the first of the year. Her 17th grandchild was just born, um, and uh, she's able to experience that part of the life and be a positive uh, force within the lives of her kids and her grandkids. Um, thanks to the fact that she's doing well. This gets to your point. Um, this medical home model of care and the success we're having in Wisconsin is starting to get a lot of attention. Um, there are now organizations in 20 different states who have reached out to ARCW for guidance on how to implement our model of care. I'm happy to say that we've replicated our model of care in Columbus, Ohio, where they have that circle available to uh, people living with HIV in Columbus. And on February 1st, they opened up that model of care in Dayton, Ohio. In the first year in Columbus, uh, they went from having 40% of their patients having an undetectable viral load to 70% of their patients having an undetectable viral load. Um, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, they signed a business planning agreement with us that I think by Christmas time will lead to the medical home model of care being delivered there. I'm excited to say that last week I got 28 hours in uh, Florida. <laughs> <laughs> I got to thaw out. <laughs> sort of forget what outside smells like when everything isn't frozen. <laughs> uh, the group in St. Petersburg, Florida is looking at retaining ARCW to uh, work on uh, our model of care there. Atlanta, um, we're going to sign a contract with them this week uh, to help develop our model of care there. And then Donna is really focused on this. <laughs> <laughs> in hopes that the Life Foundation and my friend Paul Grosbeck, who's been there for about 15 years, will agree that um, our model of care is uh, ready to be exported to Honolulu. Uh, so. But maybe not until like next November Yeah, the, the, there's a timing yeah. issue. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Why am I going to Pittsburgh in December? Yeah. <laughs> in July, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, what's happened to get to your point, Thad, is that while the government has expended a, expended a lot of dollars in the fight against AIDS, the outcome hasn't been particularly good. 28% of people with HIV having an undetectable viral load. And I think that that is largely because they have taken an approach to distribute money to make people happy rather than to create clinical outcomes. So just about every organization who's raised their hand and said we want to do something in HIV has gotten money rather than are we making a wise investment that would create better clinical outcomes. So what you're seeing in a lot of these instances is trying to integrate services together and draw those dollars together into a single person. Any questions about ARCW before I talk about the future a little bit? Um, when Hillary Clinton was uh, Secretary of State, um, she coined this phrase, an AIDS-free generation. It's, it would be a step on the way to our quest for a world without AIDS. And candidly for me, um, this is a real, um, real uh, situation. Uh, many of you know our daughters, Abby and Emma and Sarah. <laughs> 
I just love that Emma's craning her neck to be just a little bit taller than her big yeah. sister <laughs> in this picture. Uh, Donna and I had always hoped that our kids would be part of that AIDS-free generation, that they wouldn't have to hold the hands of a friend as they went to get an HIV test, or they wouldn't have to go to an AIDS funeral. Unfortunately, that's not going to be the case, given where the epidemiology is moving, given the fact that we see an increase in new HIV infections. Our hope is that maybe their kids will be part of that AIDS-free generation. And for ARCW to get there, um, there's really three things that we're focused on um, as an organization. Let's see how bad my handwriting is today. Um, the first one is this undetectable viral load. ARCW is at 82%, nationally we're at 28%. Goal's got to be 100%, right? I mean, is doing really well. We should be proud of that fact. We are internally, uh, but we still know that 18% of people living with HIV, they get care from us, don't have that undetectable viral load. And to get to that AIDS-free generation, so that people with HIV can live a long time, so that they're 96% less likely to transmit the disease, we somehow have to fill in that, that gap and get to 100%. Um, ARCW serves about 3,000 people with HIV. We know the state of Wisconsin has, uh, has reported about 8,000 people living with HIV right now. Uh, plenty of people with HIV who don't need access to that continuum of services. Well-educated, have private insurance, work, um, access health care in a more traditional sort of way. But our assessment and research shows that there's probably about 4,500 people who need access to our services. So again, trying to close that gap. More testing to identify them and get them into care and treatment. Expansion of our services in other parts of the state. Expansion of our primary care model to include um, OBGYN services, colorectal services, those sorts of things. So that's another gap that we need to fill in as an organization in order to get to that AIDS-free generation. This last one is the most convoluted one to draw, and I apologize for that. But in 1981, we reported the first HIV infections in the state of Wisconsin, and they peaked in 1993. Thanks to a lot of aggressive prevention work, we were able to cut the rate of new HIV infections in the state by more than half by the year 2000. And for the last 12 years or so, we've been bumping along at that rate of about 400 new HIV infections on an annual basis. Until we got to the 8% increase that I talked about earlier, and then after that, a 19% increase. And at ARCW, this is what we're really worried about, a double peak epidemic. Largely from young people who don't remember these days, don't remember AIDS being on the TV screens every night, don't remember walking down the street seeing the Carposi sarcoma lesions, haven't gotten the education that they need. And uh, we need to increase our HIV prevention efforts. Those are the three goals that we're focused on in the effort to try to get to this AIDS free generation. Yes, sir. Um, <coughs> the spike to just complacency, or has the virus itself changed? Less the virus change, more complacency, and um, you know, frequently, four, five, six times a year, um, I'll have the opportunity to be introduced to a new patient of ours, and their approach will be, give me that pill and let me get on with my life. That one pill, people sort of feel like this pill is a cure. All I have to do is take a pill and I'm gonna be okay, and that may be true for a, a subset of our patients, but certainly not for the most of our patients. And by the way, if you're 17 years old, are you really going to take your pill or your pills every day at the same time with the right nutrition for the next 40, 50, 60 years of our lives? Duke University did a study recently. I don't know how they do these sorts of things, but they did a study and they now claim that people with HIV can live within one year of a traditional life expectancy of someone who's HIV negative. If they get diagnosed, if they get into care, if they stay in care, if they get, can afford the medications, get on the medications, and if they take the medications, 98% accurately for the rest of their lives. Cool. Other questions? Okay. In trying to get from the 82% non-detectable viral load to 100, 
Is that 18% gap, is it because the medication's not necessarily working that well for that 18%, or is it people that just haven't fully committed to the program, or how do you explain that? I think the, the biggest one is social determinants of health. If somebody's hungry, they're gonna put food in their, try to get food for their stomach before medications. If they're homeless, they're gonna try to seek out shelter before okay. seeking out a doctor. So we're actually looking at adding a third housing facility to our operations. Um, I just toured it uh, this last week. It's down on the south side of Milwaukee right now. Our two housing facilities are on the north side of Milwaukee. So that's an example. Um, part of it, I think, is really related to mental health services. Um, I said earlier that about 50% of uh, people with HIV have need for access to mental health care during the course of their disease. And right now, we only are at about 39% of our patients are in Care. Mental health can be a very substantial uh, detriment if your mental health isn't well cared for to not taking your medications. In fact, that's probably the number one mm -hmm. reason why. And that, honestly, is just a capacity issue. Mental health therapists can only see so many patients. <laughs> mm -hmm. so. Any other questions? Please. <coughs> right, now, <coughs> right now, I'm hearing a lot about malaria. Our church is collecting all kinds of money for malaria and uh, fight. And uh, can you say something about, because you had this African thing mm -hmm. up there, can you say something about the pros and cons, ups and downs, what's your relationship with malaria? Yeah, um, thankfully, uh, stateside domestically, we don't have to deal with that issue. Internationally, um, I think that it is an outstanding model that's been developed um, around uh, confronting together HIV, malaria, and TB. Um, that's how the World Health Organization, uh, how the Lutheran Church and others have, have really gone at this as an integrated model. Um, and I, I just think that that bodes well for the future, that we quit thinking about things in terms of silos. This is a person with diabetes and we're only going to treat the diabetes. This is a person that's only at risk for malaria and we're only going to worry about malaria and start looking at whole person care. Um, and I, I actually think that's a really good example of it. The need is obviously overwhelming uh, internationally, and I'm, I'm proud that the churches do have work in that every time. Any questions? What's this say, Abby? Viva la promise. Viva la promise. Hey, our daughter takes French. Um, I'm struggling enough <laughs> with English. Um, so, uh, Viva La Promise is um, our fundraising event. Uh, it's a black tie event down at the uh, Wisconsin District Center, which was formerly known as the Southwest Airlines Center, which was formerly known as every other airline that's been in town. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, there's about 1,100 folks that will be there that night. Um, give us a chance to honor um, our social work case managers um, who churning with our patients uh, every day. Um, and it raises important awareness and funds for the fight against AIDS. Um, I am uh, speechless when I think about this church's response uh, to this event. Uh, there's oftentimes five or six tables of St. Matthew's folks or their friends who've been drawn into the event um, and very grateful for that. And uh, yet beyond that, it's usually a pretty good time <laughs> too. So um, I would encourage uh, you all to think about that and this um, is even more special, even though it doesn't have sort of a fancy logo. Um, ARCW is turning 30 soon. Um, we actually turned 29 on Saturday, August 23rd, and we're going to use that year from turning 29 to 30 to celebrate our 30 years in the fight against AIDS. And it is being kicked off by John Paradowski. Uh, John has come forward, and along with some other musical leaders, they're going to put on an extravaganza at the Sharon Lynn Wilson Center mm -hmm. that will include a choir that they recruit specifically for this evening, a performance by the Milwaukee Ballet, mm -hmm. a performance by the Milwaukee Chamber Theater, a performance by a First Stage, and I think we're still working on a special headline guest, um, but um, it is, um, I think it's a wonderful example of the music ministry at St. Matthew's having a social ministry focus in raising awareness around this. And um, we all seem to love John Paradowski around here for lots of really, really good reasons. And uh, for us, this is just another one at ARCW that he's putting on this concert for us. So. That's really the presentation I have tonight. I'd be happy to respond to any questions people have. If not, I think uh, 
10.45 is our quit time. So thank you very much.